Good, thanks for having me tonight. i am come all the way from Canada, and some of you have met our um, Canadians, which was, it was nice to meet a few of you, and I look forward to meeting a few of you afterwards, but we're here for the weekend looking um, at NSA. My daughter's interested in attending NSA, and um, uh, I was asked to preach tonight, so it's a pleasure to be with uh, your young adults group out here. But I'm going to ask you to turn in the scriptures to um, Matthew chapter 19. And what I want to talk about tonight is the importance of following the Lord Jesus Christ wherever he takes you, no matter how dangerous it is or no matter what the cost is. No matter how dangerous it is, no matter what the cost is. And we're going to meet an individual who I'm sure you're familiar with this story. If you've read the scriptures at all or you've listened, or you've been around the church at all, I'm sure you're familiar with it. But an individual who's clever, he's prominent, he's smart, he is moral, he's spiritually keen, and he is even reverent towards Christ. But he's going to hell. He's lost. He's, he's unregenerate. He's not born again. And how do I know he's not born again? Because he will not follow Christ where Christ calls him to follow him. So let me look at, let me read from Matthew 19, verse 16 through 22. Behold, a man came up to him saying, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And he said to him, Why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. If you would enter life, keep the commandments. He said to him, which ones? Jesus said, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, all these I have kept, what do I still lack? Jesus said to him, if you would be perfect, Go, sell what you possess, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. And when the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Let me pray. Oh God in heaven, we are thank you, thankful for our Lord Jesus, who's worthy, worthy of our praise, and he's worthy of our lives and all that we have, and so much more. For he has redeemed us by his very own blood. And we pray that this evening, our Lord Jesus Christ would be made much of, and that in the hearts of those who lessen you would instill his matchless worth, that the Spirit of God would move with power tonight to... Convert the lost, those who are unregenerate among us, would you convert them? And if there are any among us who are backslidden, God, would you bring them back into right fellowship with God? And if there's any here uh, tonight who have never heard of the gospel of Jesus Christ, oh, would they believe this evening? And would you strengthen your people for having gathered tonight and listened to your word? In Christ's name, amen. So we're going we're gonna to look at three questions that this young man, this rich young ruler asks, and the tragic ending that ensues. So he asks three really good questions, and then there's a tragic ending afterwards for a young man who's really coming to Christ asking about how to be converted. And I'd say that's a pretty good question. How to be converted? What must I do to be saved? This is a rich young ruler. And the, the context in Matthew, you might not be aware of this, is that Matthew 19 verses 1 through 12 it deals with marriage. And then Matthew 19 verses 13 through 15 deals with children. And then Matthew 19, 16 through 22, this evening's passage 
deals with possessions. That's a really good order of things. Marriage, children, possessions. In that order, chronologically. And so, here we are tonight talking about possessions. And there's an intentional contrast here between the previous text, which is dealing with the children. Verses 13 through 15, Jesus says, just let the little children come to me. And if you like to, for such belong the kingdom of heaven. And then this text with the rich young ruler. He's quite impressive. And the children are not terribly impressive at all. And they're the example in the text of what to be. But this man who, by all worldly standards, is the example of what not to be. So the Lord Jesus reverses it. You see the little children, and there's actually people who are shooing the children away in verses 13 and 14. And then Jesus says, let the little children come to me, and do not hinder them, for such belong the kingdom of heaven. And then he laid his hands on them. They're the impressive ones in the eyes of God. But the one who is unimpressive is the one who is impressive in the eyes of man. But he's not impressive of all in the eyes of Christ. And so this is the contrast between the little children and the rich young ruler. This young man, we find out in verse 22 that he is rich. He's a lot of money. He's young, verse 20, so that likely means he's at least younger than 40. Okay? Maybe younger than 30. Likely that perhaps the age of some of you. We know from Luke chapter 18 that he was prominent because he was a synagogue ruler. From chapter 19, verse 20 in Matthew, he's moral. Chapter 19, verse 16, he's spiritually keen. And even verse 16 of tonight's text, he is reverent towards Christ. What does he say to Jesus? His teacher. That's how he refers to him. Teacher, he's reverent, he's respectful. So there's a lot of really good attributes here. Rich, young, prominent, moral, spiritually keen, and reverent towards Christ. In in fact, if some of the young ladies in this room were to meet this man, you might think he would be potentially a good suitor. He's got a lot going for him. And there's a lot to be said about him that's good. And and if you were this young man, the first impression that I would likely have of you or that the people in your church would likely have of you or even your parents would have of you or your professors would have of you, this is a great person. This guy's got potential. He's going somewhere. Bright, smart, leader, money, respected, moral, speaks reverentially of Jesus Christ. I mean, what more could you ask for? What more could you ask for? He'd not only be welcome into membership of most churches, but he would likely be encouraged to pastor them or sit on their elders' boards. This young man would be. He's something else. But there's something terribly wrong with him. And what's terribly wrong with him is that he's not converted. In fact, he's going to hell. He's lost is all get out. And it it really should blow our minds that someone can be this respected in the the community, amongst the religious people in the synagogue. He's a leader. Speaks well of Christ. He's moral, spiritually keen. Is inquiring of the things of God. But he's not converted. He's a pretend Christian. He's a fake. He's a fake This young man comes to seek Christ. Well, he's got that going for him. He comes to seek the Lord. And he has three conversations. And this entire text pivots on those three, or three questions. This entire text pivots on those three questions. This sermon will pivot on those three questions. And so if if you want an outline of what I'm going to say, it's just, it all surrounds these, these three questions. And so I'll start with the first question. The first question is verse 16. He says, how do I get eternal life? Simple. Behold, a man came up to him saying, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And 
Really, it's a good question. What must I do to have eternal life? I mean, maybe, maybe some are asking that today. What should I do to have eternal life? He, he, eternal life simply means to have fellowship with God forever, to have a love of God in our hearts, the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, according to 2 Corinthians 4, verse 6. It's to live today and forever in light of eternity, bound not by the things of this world, but bound by the things of eternity. Eternal life is, first of all, it's a quality of existence. And it, of course, it lasts forever. It's something that is, comes to us from above. It's not something we can earn. It's not something we can fight ourselves into. It is pertaining to God's heavenly realm. It's really to live forever for the glory of God. And this man comes to Christ asking him, what must I do? What do I do to, to be saved, to inherit eternal life? And I honestly think that as you, as you look at this text, and you see this guy, and you see what he has going for him. I, I really, what I really want to drive into your hearts tonight is that I think there's a lot of professing Christians who, who, who understand the things of God on a surface level, but they've never penetrated their hearts, and they're unconverted like this gentleman is. They don't know Christ. They, they know spiritual things, they know right things, they know good things, they live wholesome lives, but they never experience a second birth. And that's what this man, that's, that's the case with him. How do I get eternal life? It's a good question. Well, Jesus answers the question in verse 17. Jesus says, and he said to him, what do you ask me about what is good? There's only one who is good. If you would enter life, keep the commandments. Now, that's not, I, I if you were doing evangelism on a street corner, or you were on a soapbox doing open-air evangelism, how many of you would give that answer, the one that Christ gave? Someone comes up to you and says, what, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And you say, well, if you want to get saved, if you want to inherit eternal life, keep the commandments. It's so counterintuitive to, to what so many of us would do. But this is precisely what Christ does, because Christ is exposing that this man is asking the wrong questions. He's not asking the right question. And the Lord Jesus wants him to know that he's not asking the right question. The man's question was, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? That's the wrong question. And we're going to get to what the right question will be by the end of this sermon, but that's the wrong question. And Jesus exposes that this man is asking the wrong question. His besetting sin is his self-sufficiency and his self-righteousness. He figures in his mind that I can do something. Something I can do to get eternal life. And so he's not coming to Christ, looking into the face of God in the flesh, saying, Christ have mercy on me, a sinner. He's coming to Christ saying, Christ, what is it that I have to do that's good so that I can live for eternity? He's focused on himself and his goodness. And the Lord is trying to just wipe that away from him. And so the Lord answers him and he lays it all down in verse 17. Now, now verse 17, the way Christ answers, that really should reduce this man to a puddle. But it doesn't because he comes back with another question. In verse 18, verse 18, he said to him, which ones? So Jesus says, well, you have to do all the commandments. And the man says, well, what commandments do I have to do? Which ones? And the, the, it clearly displays that he doesn't understand what the Lord's getting at, nor does he even understand what the law of God is. He, he thinks he knows the law of God, but he didn't even get it. He wants Jesus to name some law, this law, this law, this law, this law, do this, and it's going to be Okay. And so he says, well, what laws must I do? And Jesus answers him by quoting from the law, verse 18 through 19. He answers him again. Jesus said to him, you should not murder, you should not commit adultery, you should not steal, you should not bear false witness, honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So what does he do? He quotes the sixth commandment, Jesus does. He quotes the seventh, eighth, ninth, and the fifth commandment. 
And then he quotes from Leviticus 19, verse 18, where he says, love your neighbors yourself. The second greatest commandment that Jesus tells us is in the law of God, love your neighbors yourself. So he quotes from the Decalogue, and then he quotes from Leviticus 19, 18, which is the summary of the second table of the law. And he quotes the entire second table of the law. Six, seven, eight, nine, and five in that order. And what Jesus does by answering in this way is he proves a number of things. He proves the enduring authority of God's law. Okay, he teaches him how to, he teaches him how to live. He teaches us that we are sinners. He teaches us that we need Christ. He teaches us, it teaches us who Jesus is, because this Jesus manifests all of this, he embodies all of this. But he only quotes the second tablet or the second table. If you notice this, if you're familiar with God's law, Jesus doesn't quote the, quote the first table here. He quotes the second table, the table that pertains to how we treat one another, not the table that pertains to our worship of God, our love of God. He quotes the second table. And there, I think there's a reason he doesn't quote the first table. Because the first table is about right relationship with God. The second table is about right relationship with man. And this man's biggest problem is he's looking God in the face and he does not have a right relationship with God. And this is going to be self-evident by the time this whole thing's over. So he might profess and he might even beat his chest and he might say, hey, I've, I've kept the sixth commandment, seventh commandment, eighth commandment, ninth commandment, fifth commandment. I've loved my neighbor as myself. And then the Lord Jesus is about to tell him to do something, and he's not going to do it, which means he's in complete violation of the first table of the law. And in being in violation of the first table of the law, he's in violation of the second table of the law, as we shall see. Well, this, um, this man, that's the second question he asked in verse 18. He said to him, which ones? And Jesus answered him by quoting the second table of the law. Then the man answers again in uh, or he asked another question in verse 20, third question. Verse 20, he says, The young man said to him, All these I have kept, what do I still lack? Which reveals that he didn't understand what Jesus taught about the law, and that is that the law is kept first in the heart. And if he'd understood that, he'd understand he's a lawbreaker. Because our hearts are perpetually in violation of God's law. And he didn't understand the boundless summary of the second table. Because how did Jesus summarize the second table? He summarized it with the quotation from Leviticus 19, verse 18, which is, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Which is not a prohibition. It's not a negative command. It's a positive command. And it's a lot easier to keep a negative command than it is to keep a positive command. And I'll explain to you what I'm saying here. Jesus, Jesus quotes very clearly, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness. And that's all how you love your neighbor. I hope you understand that one of the ways you love your neighbor is by not murdering your neighbor, right? One of the ways you love your neighbor is, not by, is, is you don't commit adultery with your neighbor's wife. Those are, those are two ways you love your neighbor. But, but, the, but as we learn in the parable of the Good Samaritan, the, the love of neighbor goes way beyond simply obeying the negative commandments. It's positive. It's boundless. This is the way the Lord loves us. His, his love towards us, in one sense, even knows no limits. And so, in quoting Leviticus 19, verse 16, or 18, rather, what that should do, if you hear that commandment, Leviticus 19, verse 18, what that should do is it should completely deplete you of self-sufficiency because you should hear that and be like, that just puts me into a, a state of ruin. I got nothing left now. I'm now a puddle. I've, I'm melted. God, he should be at the point where he's saying, God, have mercy on me, but he's not there. And so he's asked this question. The young man said to him, all these I have kept, what do you... What, what do I still lack? And, and then so Jesus answers him in verse 21. Jesus said to him, If you would be perfect, go sell what you possess and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. Now, too often we read that passage and we kind of choke where he says, Go sell everything that you have and give to the poor. And that's what, what we kind of, whoa. Whoa. There's an edge to that, as there should be. But, but in choking on that commandment to this rich young man, 
we miss the second part of what Jesus said to him. The second part of what Jesus says to him is, I think, is what's most emphatic in it, which is, come follow me. That's, that's what's most emphatic here. The, the most difficult thing here is not sell everything you have and give to the poor. The most difficult thing is, is let's go get crucified. Take up your cross and follow me. That's the biggest challenge in this text. And we know this man's not willing to take up his cross and follow Christ because he's not willing to obey the simpler part of the commandment, which is give everything that you have and follow the poor. He's holding on to what he has. And he's looking God in the face in Jesus Christ, and Christ himself is now telling him, fine, you want to prove your love to me? This is what you have to do. Well, leave everything behind and, and follow me. And this isn't, this isn't new in, in Matthew's gospel, by the way. Jesus has, has told this many times. For, so, for example, in, in Matthew 4, verse 19, he tells his first disciples to come follow him, and they're fishermen, and what do they do? They leave their nets and they follow Jesus. In other words, they, they leave their means to make a living, their father's business that he passed down to him, them, and, and they follow Jesus. And then in, in chapter 8, verse 19, there's a scribe that wants to follow Jesus, and he wants to go bury his father, and then Jesus says to him, let the dead bury their own dead. So, so meaning that this man has to forsake attending his father's funeral so that he can go follow Jesus. The urgency of the matter is so serious. And then in Matthew 9, verse 9, Jesus invites Matthew to follow him, who was a tax collector, and had to leave his tax collecting to follow Christ, which was very lucrative for him. And then in chapter 16, verse 24, Jesus says, if you want to follow me, you want to be my disciple, you must deny yourself and take up the cross. And then in this passage, we, we, we have this whole statement, you, you want to follow me? Fine. Give everything up. You, you want to go to heaven? You want to have, have eternal life? Give everything up. Follow Jesus Christ. Okay? And, and so my, my point is, in saying this, is the thrust of this passage within the context of Matthew's gospel is not give everything up and give it to the poor. The thrust of it, the, the cutting point of it, is the, the hardest point of it is follow Christ. Why? Because Christ has already told us in Matthew's gospel that if you want to follow him, you've got to go to the cross. You've got to take up your cross and follow him. And so Christ's answer in verse 21 is, is look, if, if you want to have eternal life, then, then follow Jesus Christ. Go wherever he's going to lead you. And this particular man, God was calling him to forsake everything that he had and give it to the poor and then leave that behind and don't cling on to it and go with the Son of Man who has no place to lay his head. He doesn't have a, you know, the birds of the air, they have nests, and Jesus Christ has no, foxes have holes. Jesus has no place to lay his head. The Son of Man has no place to lay his head. So follow Christ and trust him. Well, he doesn't want this. That, that's not for him. He was calling him to be a disciple, and, and that's, that was not what this man wanted. And what we have here is an absolutely tragic ending to this series of questions and, uh, and answers, because it says in verse 22, when the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. He couldn't, he couldn't handle this thought. It's, it's absolutely tragic. And, and the phrase here, sorrowful, it's like, oh, I can't have Jesus? I can't have eternal life? Because that means I have to part with the things that I love the most, which means what? He doesn't love Christ the most. He's not willing to give these things up. He's not willing to cut ties with them. And so in this very commandment, remember the man came to Jesus and he said in verse 16, he said, teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And then, it, and then there's a series of questions and answers. Then it really comes down to verse 21. If you would be perfect, go sell what you possess and give to the poor. Well, there's the summary of the second table of the law. Love your neighbor as yourself. Okay? And... Come follow me. There's the first table of the law. God gets everything. Christ gets everything. You will have no other gods before me. And Jesus is demanding absolute allegiance at this particular point in time. And because the man will not give his absolute allegiance to Jesus Christ, it's proof positive that yes, 
Sure, he's a moral man. Sure, he has respect for Jesus. Sure, he's prominent in the synagogue. But he is not genuinely converted. He doesn't know Christ. And it's absolutely tragic. J.C. Ryle said of this, he says, We see for one thing from the case of this young man that a person may have desires after salvation and not be saved. He was sorrowful. He felt conviction and desired salvation. He was anxious about eternity. He was moral, but he was not converted because he was holding on to the things of this earth. Even though he felt a pull to heaven, he would not forsake and abandon what he was clinging on to this earth because Christ commanded him to do it, and he would not do it. Spurgeon commented on this, and he says, We must love Jesus and his great cause better than our wealth, or else we are not his true followers. If our religion were ever put to the great test of fierce persecution, and we had to part with all our property or part with Christ, hesitation in that moment would be fatal. It's fatal to even hesitate. He did not believe that Jesus was valuable. He thought his stuff was more valuable. And I think the overwhelming majority of professing Christians today, they're like this rich young man. Because when it comes to the test, there's some things that they just can't part with for the sake of Christ. And I've seen this in my own country. I said I came down here from Canada. And I was, um, about two years ago, we were really put to the test in our country. And we were faced, do we want to open our churches and worship the Lord Jesus Christ and proclaim his worth? Or do we want to live comfortably and compromise and somehow syncretize the commandments of God with what our government was asking us to do with the various lockdowns? And, and a number of us had to face these things. And I remember staying up late at night, laying in bed thinking, if I keep my church open, if I keep it open, I could lose my house, lose everything. But then having to actually come to that conclusion where I had to say, but Christ is worth it. He's worth it. He's worth all of it and then even more because there's nothing I can do to repay what he's given me. If he's truly shed his very own blood for my soul, so that all of my sins have been washed away by the blood of the cross, and complete atonement has been given, and full pardon has been granted towards me, then who am I to hold back anything from him? I can't hold back a thing. Because he owns me and he owns everything I have. And this is what the Lord is asking of us. And so I want to ask you this question. What are you holding back from Jesus Christ tonight? What are you clinging on to in your hearts? What is it that you love more than him? Is there something that is gripping you that you're just like, I can't give that up. I'm not willing to come clean with that. I'm not willing to let that go. That might cost me something. No way. No, sir. Well, well then you've just violated the first table of the law like this man because now you have another God before you other than Christ. So are you truly converted or not? Because you don't want to walk away from this sorrowful, oh, I wish, yes, it's, I feel guilty and I feel convicted above it, but, but I can't do it. Well, that's this man. The, the, the question of the hour that, your, that our generation is going to have to face is, is Jesus worth it? Is he worth it? I have, I have a sense that what we've been through the last few years, you probably think the same thing. Is I think they've just backed off for a little bit and they're retooling. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe they'll get nicer. Maybe they will. But something tells me they're not. And so we have to grapple with this. Is Jesus Christ worth it? And for this man, he wasn't. Is he worth it for you? Let me have prayer for you. Oh God in heaven, we thank you for our Savior who's worthy, who's perfect, who deserves everything, and so much more because he's purchased us by his own blood. Oh God in heaven, I pray that every man and woman in this room, every man and woman in this room would count the cost of discipleship and seek Jesus Christ above all things. 
Learning what it is to fully delight in and trust in the matchless Son of God who has come to bear the full guilt for our sins and grant us complete pardon for our iniquities. And for those here tonight who are under conviction and there's things they need to repent of, oh God, give them the grace to repent. And for those, Father, who are feeling the weight of this passage, I pray, God, that you would continue to melt every single one of us so that we would call out, oh God, have mercy on us, sinners. That we would be poor in spirit. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.